we have been, the past few weeks, talking about a, a series dealing with the kingdom of God. And uh, the kingdom of God we defined as the rule of God over the universe he created. And that a kingdom, oftentimes we look at a kingdom and we say a kingdom is the geographical area in which a king rules, like the kingdom of England or the kingdom of France. And, uh, and the kingdom of God isn't a geographical area. It is the sovereign rule of God and the influence of that rule. So it's the dominion of God. And, uh, and right now, uh, that dominion of God is primarily over hearts and minds of people who are willing to enter into and come under, surrender to his rule. And so we've defined the kingdom of God that way. Now, a lot of times people think the kingdom of God, well, that's heaven. That's some way in the future. You know, that's, uh, you know, that's not here. That's not now. And, um, and obviously, uh, in the future, in the age to come, God's kingdom is going to come fully. And, uh, and that will, you know, there, there will be no evil. There will be no prayer uh, you know, for healing because all will be healed. You know, every eye is going to be wiped. There's going to be no more tears. The kingdom of God fully coming in the future. But right now, we're living in a time where the the reign of God can be seen in the earth. Not everywhere. Everything that happens isn't part of the kingdom of God. There's a lot of things that are evil. There are a lot of things, I mean, you can read the newspaper, And you can look and you say, oh, my goodness, look at this injustice. Oh, my goodness, look at this tragedy. You know, where's God's kingdom? Well, God's kingdom is here, but not fully. It's breaking in. And so we're talking about that. It's a whole concept. And I I believe that understanding the kingdom of God is key to living our Christian life. We don't understand the, the nature of the kingdom of God and, and how God exercises his sovereign rule and who we are in relationship to him and his rule, then we're going to be ineffective in terms of living our Christian life and in, in terms of sharing the message of the good news. So a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Genesis chapter 1 and we saw that God created men and women in his image, male and female. And we said that the image of God, the Imago Dei, is something that is, you know, obviously God doesn't have a physical body, so you can't say, look at me, Uh, God looks just like me. No. It is um, the spiritual uh, imprint that God has given our lives. It is the uh, capacity to have relationship, the ability to think, to create. We went through all those characteristics. But one thing we said about the image of God is that we are different than all other creation. That God created us as human beings uniquely, apart from all the other creation, because we're made in his image, the only thing in creation made in his image. And we, as his image bearers, represent God in creation. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, remember? We represent God. We represent who he is. And and he has given us a dominion, a a mandate, that we are to exercise dominion over creation, you know, uh, and and to be co-rulers with him. But that dominion is that we are to fill the earth with his image, with his likeness. And we do that through having children, We do that through exercising responsible stewardship and care for the the globe around us. We do that by our creativity, whether it's music or art or drama or whether it's landscaping or building a building or, you know, solving a math problem or doing medicine. Whatever it is, there's creativity and that is filling the earth with the image of God. God has given that us that dominion. Last week we looked in Genesis chapter 3 where the enemy came to Adam and Eve while they were in the garden and and they were given responsibility to manage the garden. And um, and the enemy came and challenged their understanding. 
They could eat from any tree in the, in the garden except for one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they were not to be able, God says, don't eat from that tree. And so the enemy came and, and he deceived Eve and he tricked Adam and, uh, and they thought that God was withholding something from them so they ate from the tree. And, um, and their eyes were opened and they experienced good and evil. Now, God wanted to give them an understanding, a discernment of evil, but not the experience. And, and when that happened, we call that, that the fall of mankind. Adam and Eve fell from God's grace. Something changed in their spirit. They were corrupted. And every single one of us who are descendants of that first, you know, parents, spiritual parents, we inherited that corruption in our spirit. And you know, you look at even the best person. Mother Teresa was interviewed just before she died. And uh, and people were, you know, saying to her, aren't you just so, you know, glad of all the good work she did? She says, no, I'm just a lousy person. If you knew me on the inside, I'm a lousy person. You see, when we look at ourselves, we see the corruption. And if we're really honest, just within our own selves, we can look and we say, yeah, I, I, can, I can identify with, with the Apostle Paul when he says, nothing good is in me. See, that's the corruption of sin. That's what we inherited. And when the enemy deceived Adam and Eve, he stole away the dominion that God had given them. And now there is a different kingdom in the world, the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan. We talked about that last week. And I want to look at this week that epic battle that has been raging ever since the garden. We are in a spiritual battle. But oftentimes the tactics of the enemy, Satan, and he's real, he's a created being, he's a fallen angel, is to deceive even those who trust in Jesus. And if he can keep us in darkness, or keep us believing a half-truth, then he'd keep us ineffective. And sometimes that half-truth is, well, he doesn't exist. Funny-looking guy with a red suit and pointy tail. No, he's an, he can come as an angel of light. Or if... It, you know, there are just so many lies that he can give. But that battle rages today. And, uh, and, and, and it rages in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. It's in, in the, and the battleground is our hearts and minds because the enemy wants to keep us from coming to Jesus. He wants to deface the image of God. And the issue is his dominion. And for us, it's which dominion will have, uh, you know, will win in our communities, in our families, in our culture. Now, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus, it says Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So that was Jesus' purpose. He came in order to undo what the enemy has done, uh, beginning with Adam and Eve. In Colossians 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 13, it says that Jesus came to rescue us from the dominion of darkness, the rule of darkness that's in the world, and we know it's there because we read the newspapers. He came to rescue us from that dominion and literally transfer us into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of God. And, and um, there, there is a transferal that takes place. And so the entire Bible is about a story, a love story that God has for his created creation, for men and women that he created in his image and he wants to have a relationship with, but sin broke that relationship. And all that God has done in order to rescue us out of this dominion of darkness, out of an empty way of life, 
out of, out of knowing on the inside that somehow there's something not right within us. And he's redeemed us because of Jesus' death on the cross and the power of his resurrection. And so I want to look at John chapter 3. And we're going to read a portion of that chapter and, um, and look at this battle that occurs and the victory that has already been won and what our response to that should be. And I want to start reading in verse 14. It says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Everyone who believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. So, in this particular passage, you know, to set the context in, in uh, John 3, just before this, there was a teacher of the law who came to Jesus. His name was Nicodemus. He came at night. Um, someone said that's the first Nick at night, but um, you can laugh. <laughs> just want to see if you're listening. But, but Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, and he said, you know, you're a teacher from God. We recognize that. How do I inherit eternal life? He was questioned. And Jesus said to him, he said, you need to be born from above or born again, born of the Spirit of God, if you're going to see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, whoa, 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 wait, wait a second. I've already been born. You know, how, how do I go back into my mother's womb? And <laughs> Jesus says, Nicodemus, you're missing my point. You have to be born of the Spirit of God. That word born again literally means be born from above. Have a spiritual rebirth, the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart and life in order to enter into the kingdom of God. And, um, and we know that's true, that anyone who comes to faith in Jesus, who puts their trust in, in what Jesus has done to pay the penalty for our sin, and surrender our lives to him. You know, we come and God does something in our heart. He changes our nature. He not only forgives our acts of sin, he heals the sin sickness that's within our very nature, and we've been remade in Christ. Even though we still struggle with the battle that goes on within our lives. That's the decisive victory Jesus won. And then in verse 14... Jesus is talking and he said, the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, needs to be lifted up. In other words, this was before he died on the cross. He says, I need, to be, I need to give my life as a sacrifice upon the cross. In the same way that Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. Now, what in the world is Moses doing lifting a snake up in the wilderness? Let me tell you the story. The Israelites had just come out of Egypt, miraculously delivered, by the power of God, they were in the desert, and they weren't in there very long, and they began to murmur to God, because all I see is sin, and we just have manna to eat, and you're not giving us enough water, and when are we going to get there? They're like a bunch of kids going on a long trip with their parents in the back seat saying, are we there yet? <laughs> and they were whining and moaning and murmuring and, 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 you know, just basically saying, God, you're not keeping your promise. Well, God got mad. And he sent serpents to judge them into the camp. And they started biting people, and people started dying. And so Moses goes before God, 
and he intercedes. He stands between God and the people, and he says, God, what are you doing? And he cries out before God, and he says, Lord, don't do this. And God says, step back. I'll take care of it, and I'm going to raise up someone from you. He says, no, these are your people, and he intercedes for the people of God. And so God says, here's what you need to do. He says, make a serpent out of bronze, lift it up in the pool, and you tell the people that anyone who's bit, if they look to the bronze serpent, they will be healed. It's a picture of Jesus. And so he did that, and, and, and people who were bit by these serpents, they would look up at the bronze snake, and they were healed and restored because they put their trust in God as their healer and deliverer. And so Jesus said, the same way Moses did that, well-known story, Nicodemus would have known it, he said, the same way I am that bronze serpent. And even today, the symbol for the medical community is a serpent around a pole. That's where they got it from. And, uh, and so Jesus says, I must be lifted up like that serpent. If I'm lifted up, people can look to me in faith and be healed of the sin sickness that they have. And then he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, sacrificed to the cross that anyone who believes in him, who puts their trust in him, will not perish but have eternal life, will live forever. And he says that Jesus came in the world not to condemn the world, not to point fingers and say, you're not doing it right, because he knows that people who are not empowered by the Holy Spirit can't live right lives. Jesus came in love, motivated by love, in order to establish his kingdom because he knows that there's a battle between light and darkness and that the enemy has already, you know, worked his way in and has sought to mar the image of God in humanity. And Jesus came to restore that. And so, you know, John, in telling the story, is is commenting and saying, this is why Jesus came. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, to rescue him to rescue us, to bring us from darkness into light. And that's the battle. A decisive victory has been won with Jesus' death upon the cross. But the battle rages on between which dominion will win or exercise influence in any given life in any given time. In verse 18, he says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. In other words, God isn't saying, well, because you didn't believe in me, I'm condemning you. No, we, we have already a death sentence hanging over our heads because of Adam and Eve's sin. And God is saying, I'm here to rescue me. Look to Jesus. And whoever looks to Jesus in faith is healed. Moves from Condemnation out of condemnation. You see, just as Moses interceded for God's people, and the, the word intercede means to stand in between. I want you to get this picture. You got this kid in school. He's small. And this big kid comes and starts bullying him. Who's going to be his advocate? This nice kid stands in between them and says to the bully, back off. That's intercession. That's what Moses did. Moses went before God on behalf of the people and said, Lord, don't do this. And God listened to Moses. Jesus goes between the Father and us. And he says, those who will look to me, we're transferring them into my kingdom. They'll come under my rule. And my protection, because a king's job is to protect its citizens, right? Think about it. So if we're under the kingdom of God, then we are under the sovereign protection of Jesus. And so Jesus is using that here. He's saying, you know, light and darkness, two different dominions or kingdoms. The question is, which one will we align ourselves with? Which 
Which dominion, darkness or light, will we come under? And we have a choice. Because God's heart is to draw everyone from darkness to light. Not everyone's going to choose that. We know that. But our hearts, as Christians, is to pray and intercede and stand before God on behalf of those who are still blinded in darkness. That battle rages today. And so I want you to look at your, you know, you look at your neighborhoods, look at your workplaces, look at your families, look at your lives, and recognize that, that no one is just simply being obstinate. They're under the sway of one kingdom or, or another, light or darkness. Now, I want to ask you a question. Which wins, light or darkness? Light. If you've got a dark, dark room, right, and you go into that room and you light a candle, what happens to the darkness? It disappears. One candle can give out an amazing amount of light in a dark room. Now, if we lit a candle here, middle of the day, some lights on, you look at the candle, you can say, I can see the flame, but you don't see the effect of the light. But if this room were completely dark, or if you're down inside a cave and you lit a match, that match would throw a lot of light. You know, that is the power, you know, that's the image Jesus used, but that's the power of the kingdom of God. It causes the kingdom of darkness to flee. Now, these... Two kingdoms have characteristics that are in the Bible, and I'm just going to share a couple of things, and, and, and you, know, you can recognize them. That when we look at the dominion of Satan versus the dominion of Jesus, one is dead in sin, the other is alive in Christ. The dominion of darkness is rooted in self-centeredness. It's all about me. No one else matters. No one else exists. The kingdom of Jesus is surrender to the Lord and being willing to serve somebody else, be willing to follow his example and give your life for somebody else. Um, kingdom of darkness, you love darkness. As the scripture says, men love darkness instead of the light because their deeds are evil. They, they don't want to be exposed. But when we come into the kingdom of Jesus, then um, we walk in the light as he is in the light. And we don't fear exposure. We don't fear doing something wrong because we're not under condemnation. God loves us. We can love one another, and we can help one another grow in, in our walk with Jesus. Dominion of Satan, people are blind to the light. They don't see the gospel. You know, sometimes we talk about you know, who God is, and, 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 and people are just like, I don't get it. I don't get it. Because the enemy can put blinders in front of our eyes. I remember before I was saved, um, listening to a message on Isaiah 53, which is like the penultimate passage in the Old Testament about Jesus. And the guy who brought me to church says, wasn't that great? And I'm going <laughs> over my head. I don't know what the guy was talking about. I was blind. Six months later, I got saved. And I look back and I go, how could I be so blind? But that's what the enemy does. You know, in the kingdom, kingdom of light, we have discernment. We can see spiritual things. We have different eyes. There's the deeds of the flesh in the kingdom of darkness and the fruit of the spirit in the kingdom of light. Bondage to sin versus freedom. And so... In these two kingdoms, and there's only two kingdoms spiritually in the world today. There is no neutral crown. There is no spiritual Switzerland. <laughs> it doesn't exist. We're born into the kingdom of darkness, and we can opt by faith to move into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of Jesus by our choice. We get to make that choice every single day, by the way, even as Christians. We can be saved because of our trust in Jesus, but we can be hanging out in the kingdom of darkness, and God can't use us. So every day we can make a choice, Lord, 
I want to walk in the light. I want to walk under your authority. I want to walk uh, in the power of your spirit. And when we do that, we choose to walk in the kingdom of, of uh, light. Jesus said that we are the light of the world. We sang about Jesus being light in his incarnation, and he came into the world to show us you know, who the Father is. But, but we, if Jesus is living inside of us by faith, we are the lights of the world. And so in this epic battle that rages between two kingdoms, we get to be that candle that's lit in a dark room. We get to be the light of Jesus right where we live. We get to bring the dominion of Jesus. We get to bring God's kingdom as we pray, Lord, let your kingdom come on earth the same way it is in heaven. We get to bring that to where we live. I want to tell you a story um, about my wife. (laughs) She doesn't know I'm going to do this. It's a good story. Um, <laughs> fr- Friday, we went to calling hours for um, a friend of ours. Um, he's a pastor, and he died. Um, and his wife was someone that Carol knew even before we knew each other, Carol and I. And, um, and she was a teacher in a public school, um, had taught this woman's, Elfie is her name, taught Elfie's uh, younger sister and became a kind of a big sister to both this other girl, Billy, and Elfie. And through her relationship with Jesus, was talking about who Jesus is. And, and um, eventually, when Elfie grew and became a young adult, going through a lot of hard times, she, um, she came to Jesus. She put her trust in Jesus, got born again. She was really, really down. And, of course, you know, Carol had been in contact with her uh, through the years and just talking about who the Lord is and stuff. And she came down, hit in the very bottom, uh, you know, as far as she could go, and she called a um, a DJ in a radio station um, to request a song, and they started talking. And long story short, this DJ was a Christian, met with her afterwards, led her to the Lord. Eventually, she became his wife, and they were pastoring a church. One little light. One life touching another life. And when we went to the calling hours, we met their children who are all serving the Lord. Pastor Tim's son is taking over his church. We met Elfie's mom, who was as rough as they come. She's a Christian. Some of Elfie's sisters and siblings have become Christians. And you see the influence of the kingdom being spread into a family that was so dysfunctional they could write the book. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. I want you to think about where you live. Now, we're a small church. We leave here, we get scattered all around Bourne and Falmouth and Sandwich. I think we have representatives in our church in every village in Bourne. And we got some villages in Falmouth and Sandwich and so forth. Remember the diagram last year with the red dots? They're all in the corner, and you can see them spread out. You know, when we're scattered and spread out, we are those lights, those candles that you can influence right where you are. I want to challenge you in this battle that you would begin to see yourselves as those red dots that represent Jesus right where you live, with your neighbors, with your family, with your coworkers when you go to work. What would happen if you interceded for them the same way Moses interceded for Israel? If we would have followed the example of Jesus as he interceded and stood before the Father on our behalf, and we interceded in prayer, and we said, Lord, 
just as Carol, and when I got to know Carol, we, we, we were praying for Alfie to come to know Jesus. And that one of your neighbors, one of your co-workers, one of your family members is drawn to Jesus. What would happen? What would happen if that one little light that's one family and one village and neighborhood in Bourne begins to see, you begin to see two or three other families join together and there is a community, a kingdom community in that village. You see, that's my, that's my heart, that's my vision for our church is that the light of Jesus would go through us and that we would see kingdom communities in every village. It's kingdom communities in East Falmouth over in, in, in Sandwich, um, in Buzzards Bay, Sagamore Beach, as we begin to pray and believe that the power of God in his kingdom can reach out and draw people to put their trust in Jesus. They need to be born again from above. That's, it's not our, our goodness or our good looks or our ability to speak. It is the power of God in his kingdom that does that. And I believe wholeheartedly that God has people that he is calling all throughout this region to him. They're going to come from dysfunctional families. They're going to come from people who are right now living in darkness and don't know anything else. But we're the lights. We can bring the good news of Jesus. We can bring the dominion of the kingdom and it begins with prayer. Consistent daily prayer. Specifically for people. If you don't know your neighbors, go knock on their door, bring them a bunch of cookies, and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. Here's some cookies. All you got to do. How are you doing? And if they say, oh man, things aren't going well, I'm going to be praying for you. And then you go before the Lord. And you go back a few days later and say, how is it going? See what God does. The kingdom of God is supernatural. But we need to be supernaturally natural. And it's the power of prayer that does that. It's that power of the light shining in darkness. And, and I want to challenge you to get a vision for that, to see that, to believe that, to see that spiritually. And if you look and you say, oh, it's impossible. Well, what does the Bible say? With God, the impossible becomes possible. Amen? So I want to close us in prayer, but I want you to help. I want you to think about people that you've been praying for. I want you to think about people that live next to you, the people that you, that you see week in and week out. And, uh, and I want you to pray for them. Pray for them you know, before the Lord quietly, and then I'll close in, um, in, in, in a corporate prayer. So let's do that. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your kingdom. And we pray, Lord, that your kingdom would come here, where we are. And it would be seen the same way as it's seen in heaven. Lord, we choose to live under the dominion of your kingdom, surrendering our lives to you. 
And we ask, Lord, that you would use us as light shining in a dark place. Not to condemn people for their actions, but to share the love of Jesus, the truth of the cross and the resurrection, the opportunity to change their, their address from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Lord, use us. Lord, give us, give us a, a, a burden in prayer for people that we know. Maybe even pr- people that can irk us because of their lifestyle. But Lord, we ask that you would rescue our neighbors, our family members, our friends, our co-workers from the power of darkness that holds sway over their hearts and minds. And the Lord, that you would bring them into a, a relationship with you that changes and transforms their lives, that brings them hope and life. Lord, that brings them into the kingdom of, of light. And so, Lord, we just humbly ask, use us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as we have our benediction? It's taken from Psalm 33, starting in verse 16. It says, No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. So it's not up to us. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help. And our shield. In him our heart rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. May God bless you.